Hey guys, what's up? Haru. One of the things I find interesting about the world of Genshin Impact is the concept of realms and their relation to Tevet's state of order. Realms within the game were only ever mentioned once from an event that you may or may not even remember anymore. The Three Realms Gateway offering in Enkanomiya with the help of one of my favorite characters, Tumi. The entire event was about repelling the encroaching void that the Abyss Order released in Enkanomiya, while at the same time saving Watatsumi by restoring their unstable soil and the baptismal bishops that reside there. But after going through 4.4 Chen Yu Veil, it highlights the difference between elemental beings, every living thing, and the abyss itself. Their inclinations with different levels of exposure to each of the three realms, all-in-one event quest, and even a sort of trinity of the realms, where even though Enkanomiya is where all three are most powerful, they still cancel each other out while being still relatively livable. Sadly, it was only experienced by the players who were able to actually take part in said event, but don't worry, I'll go over a quick summary of the event along with an introduction to the concept of realms in the game, then we'll go over some theory on its relation to the three states of order in Tevet and what happens when they overlap, achieve balance, or be removed entirely. As always, timestamps below if you want to see a specific segment. Let's go! Realms are a sort of representation for all forms of life in and around Tevet. For now, we have at least three realms. The Light Realm, which is represented by all things elemental, the Void Realm, which reflects everything Abyss-related, and the Human Realm, which includes all manner of life and was created during the formation of humanity in the world. But humanity would come after the Light and the Void Realm, because these two first realms have already existed even before humanity came into play. The initial start of the Human Realm is assumed to form when the Primordial One created the first humans of Tevat and created their laws, which happened after the Heavenly War when the Dragon lords of the Light Realm were defeated. One of the big components of the Human Realm is life, of which was said to be created by the Primordial One and the Shades. Initially creating birds of the air, beasts of the earth, fish of the sea, plants of the forest, and all manner of quote-unquote life that you see today. Ley lines and the Urban Soul as well include an interesting aspect of human beings, and that is memory, where all of Tevat's records of the past, i.e. memories, are stored. These events and memories of the past can also be altered by certain individuals given their level of authority and one's own ability to manipulate it. And because the Archons are susceptible to Urban Soul changes, we can assume that they are part of the human realm to some degree. The same goes for what we know as the quote-unquote god kings, like Mondstadt's the Caribbean, Sumeru's King Deshrit, Fontaine's King Remus, as well as other god kings. A sort of special case that I would mention are the Four Shades, Easteroth, the Three Moon Sisters, Nabu Malikata, or the Goddess of Flowers, and the Sili. Such deities or envoys we can assume are a tier below the primordial one but are still above the laws of the human realm, which would make sense why they were punished for mingling too much with humanity long ago, causing the fall of the Sili era and the Moon Sisters. Such events and phenomena only affect humans, however, and beings that aren't part of the human realm aren't affected by such changes. One example is the Udex of Fontaine, Nouvellet, whose dragon sovereign descent has made him separate from the human realm's intricacies. One of those intricacies also include fate and constellations, which is a big part of human society and is studied by astrologers in different ways all over Tevet. This means that only those in the human realm are affected by fate, constellations, and by extension, Celestia, and that includes the seven Archons themselves. The only thing that is tied to Celestia but is more related to the Light Realm or Elemental Realm is that Ley Lines and Erminsol also store elemental energy. Interestingly, when the seven were created, one of the rewards included remembrances of the Primordial One called the Gnosis, as well as shards of mastery that's given to humans called Visions, something more akin to the original state of this world, a state where elemental dragons would rule. Nouvellet to me is one of the best representations of the Light Realm that ended up with the Human Realm, the dragon of water that possesses the most pure form of hydro energies, who can bestow visions not for those with a burning passion or for something tied to Celestia, but as a reward for human will and dedication. As mentioned in his vision lore, creatures of the Light Realm can also be called creatures of the Elemental Realm. Often called Elemental Life Forms, they are concentrations of pure elemental energy that have taken 
taken a quote-unquote form of life on the surface. During the reign of the Dragon Lords, elemental energy would have been in its primitive and raw form, and only those that can handle such high levels of elemental purity can survive that time. Humans, animals, and plants, if you were wondering, can't really survive that high of a concentration of elemental energy. And the only reason humans are alive today is because the level of elemental concentration is much, much milder than it was during the reign of the Dragon Lords. It's worth noting that things of life and things of elemental form are two different things. But you can, of course, get a mix of the two. Which is how you can see elemental life forms that are already living in the realm of humans, but with a much lower level of elemental concentration and, by extension, power level. If we were to go back to the elemental state as we are today, humans and animals and basically all forms of life would all either die from too much elemental energy or be infused with some form of elemental mutations. The only beings we can assume are pure elemental beings start with the Hydro Dragon, Nouvellet, Slimes, Hypostasis, the Oceanids, Elemental Spectres, Mimics which are most likely not exclusive to Hydro, and Eyes of the Storms. Some debatable possible elemental life forms are the Valin, being created by the convergence of elemental energy in the heavens, which is Celestia from my understanding, and Venti being a wind spirit that became an Archon, Zhongli's actual origins being more than 6,000 years old, and Ajdaha's origin from CN and EN translation problems of which I think he is a dragon. The other, more special cases, being the thunder manifestations which could be creations from the pure electro dragon, just like the pure oceanids after the hydro dragon's defeat. The hydro tulpa from Fontaine, which I can only think of as an amalgamation of wills of oceanids that failed to become human, or humans that failed to become part of the ocean. Then there's the dragon king, Nibelung, of which we don't really know his element yet, and the Dendro Dragon, a pep, who was afflicted by forbidden knowledge that comes from the Abyss. The Void Realm, or the Will of the Abyss, is one of the biggest antagonists of the game, and is also the reason we level up our characters to fight the endgame content, the Spiral Abyss. Both the Light Realm and the Human Realm cannot handle the Void Realm's spread. And the origins of the Abyss, as well as how it came to be, is still up to speculation. Some say it's the quantum energy from Hoyoverse's previous games coming to test the vat, while others say it's more of an in-game undead element manifesting the regret of lost souls. God remains, curses, beasts of sin, greater and lesser sinners, and dark wills. Maybe something or someone that infiltrates the vat and corrupts everything that it has. Whatever it is, it's dangerous and harmful to everything it comes into contact with. Many of the abyss creatures we find are from the abyss order, who wish to topple Celestia for destroying Conria, living in the abyss and were able to adapt to its conditions. Some are infested with abyssal energy that causes them to mutate into monstrous and cursed forms like Daneslift, Clotar, Caribear, or Kaya. Others who got a worse form of curse are the Hilly Churls. We also have King Ermin, assumed to be King of Conria, Rhine Daughter, or Great Sinner Gold, and her dragons Durin and Elinas, who weren't really intentionally bad per se. While things outside of Tavat, like the Narwhal, or Child, Skirk, and Sertology, as well as possibly the Hex and Zirkel, still lack information on their origins and motives. A special case, and something that I can't put into any other category, is the second one who came, which was part of the Second Heavenly War. So honestly, who knows what else dwells in the Abyss. Other forms of abyssal energy is forbidden knowledge or the apocalypse, a type of wisdom that is not from Tevat, often found by looking through the lost histories of the world and unveiling secrets buried beneath the world. A good example of this happening is the chasm's upside down city and the nail that cleansed it, likely a civilization that found the secrets of the abyss and the sky, which then caused the abyss to spread there and prompted Celestia to drop a divine nail. But this also reveals the few ways of removing said abyss, but hasn't properly been studied yet until just recently. And even then, the further study of such ways to purify the oozing abyss masses pose massive risks to anyone who would dare to study it. But the results of these studies were quite worth it, I must say. The lumen spar that we find in the chasm are the few ways to dispel or purify the abyss, which are forms of the void realm's advances into Tevat. 
The lumen lamps and lumen infused objects and fauna found all over the chasm are similar to the chasm's divine nail, giving off a faint warmth and echoes from the heavens, as well as soft voices when held close to the ears. Another way to cleanse the abyss is through the previous Hydro Archon and the Pool of Amrita, which was said to be able to cure any disease and cleanse all forms of abyss. Finally is through the removal of root sources of the abyss or forbidden knowledge, which is how we were able to cure the Ermin Soul at the cost of removing Rukadevata's consciousness. Removing or purifying the abyss completely are the few ways to deal with it, but Maybe there's a third strategy, one that causes all three realms to hold each other equally. The three realms gateway offering, if summed up, is the removal of abyssal energy from Enkanomia. The actual name of the event is called aphotic diffusal. The word aphotic means lack of light or growing in the absence of light. And to diffuse this lack of light, we must perform the three realms gateway offering. Funnily enough, in marine geology or marine studies, the aphotic zone is divided into three levels of deepness, starting with the bathial zone, then the abyss zone, and finally the hadal zone in that specific order. So we can imagine what lies beneath Enkanomia when you find that the devs call this mass of mist the river Styx. So the quest starts off with Kokomi saying that the soil of Watatsumi did not revert its previous damages, which is already similar to Chen Yu Vale's situation. Now it's worth noting that you need to do the Dainichi Mikoshi quest and perform what's called the Watatsumi Goryo Matsuri to restore the soil of the land, again similar to Chen Yu Vale, of which was a sort of awakening ritual in Enkanomiya using Orobashi's coral branch to awaken its familiars, the Sango Coralia, which is important because these special familiars eat up the raw and primitive elemental energies, making it into milder elemental energy so that the human realm can withstand it. Along this quest, we meet a masked snake-eyed shrine maiden named Sumi who introduces us to the Three Realms Gateway offering ritual and asks us to cleanse what's called Towers of the Void that was restored to their original form by a certain abyss lector, Enjo. But these towers don't just release the void or the abyss. By activating or seemingly switching the towers' heads, you can make it harness and then let in the energy of the light realm instead of the void realm. The third of these three towers can only be the energy from the ley lines of the human realm. The reason for that is because Enkanomiya is where all three of these realms are exceptionally strong. The overwhelming power of raw elemental energy, the toxic or intoxication of abyssal energy, and the abundant memories of ley lines. Basically, Enkanomiya is where these three realms converge, and the only way to maintain a balance between them and stop them from overlapping with each other is through the three realms offering. If the abyss overlaps, then we get what we see from the event itself, a spread of darkness and only the Dainichi Mikoshi is left with light. If the light realm overlaps, then we would get what Enkanomiya looked like before the Dainichi Mikoshi, a land of baptismal vishaps. And if the human realm overlaps, we'd get the previous Enkanomiya and the Sun Children when they first ousted their sage, Abrax or Aberaku. But a balance between the three realms is needed to maintain Enkanomiya and keep everything from overlapping, hence the three realms gateway offering. Now if you've finished Chen Yuvel's Blessing of Sunken Jade World Quest, the idea of three realms and states of order would make a lot more sense. But TLDR, Chen Yuvel's spirit veins were being set back to what was called the natural order by the Suwani named Ling Yuan. And this natural order that she wishes to bring back is the one overflowing with spiritual power. And it was implied by Fujin that Chen Yuvel changed to fit the needs of humanity and because Fujin and the Herb Lord saw that humans were also creatures and by extension, part of nature. So using that same nature with the three realms of Tavat and its history, we can sort of picture what each realm wants to create and why it needs to be balanced. Let the light realm overflow, then anything or anyone non-elemental wouldn't be able to survive and if they're lucky, would mutate into creatures infused with elemental energy. They would need to also compete 
and live just like the era of elemental dragon sovereigns. Let the void realm flood all of the vat, then the resentment of the world and what can only be described as the chaos that is toxic to everything but is intoxicating to abyss dwellers would literally drown the world with abyssal energy. Finally, letting the human realm flourish would lead to something similar to Enkanomiya's Sun Children or the aristocracy of Mondstadt or the sin of humans during the ancient civilization, where humans would overthrow each other over greed and selfishness. But if you create a balance between all three, then you'll have the current day to that where elemental energies are kept to a minimum for humans to live peacefully and maybe even coexist with elemental beings to a certain degree, of which we already know from Natlan and Fontaine, where ley lines and the Ermin soul keep memories of the past and keep away what should not be known and used, just like in Sumeru. Also, where the Void Realm feeds on the resentment and chaos, but is also kept at bay, forbidden knowledge being hidden away from prying eyes and sealing it away. If it does come to the surface, then the human realm's gods would drop divine nails so that it would be quote-unquote cleansed, of which humanity itself has already started to cleanse it on their own. Maybe at some point we won't be needing divine nails, but just these lumen spars and have people who can actually fend off the abyss. A state of nature that creates a sort of peaceful relationship with all things, where a balance between all forces are reached but at the cost of having humans dominate the lands. Fortunately, however, humans of this current time seem to be more appreciative and friendlier towards non-human races, creatures, and even elemental beings. At least the majority of humans. Being friends with the Aranara, the Melusines, and Vishaps, and even Hilly Churls to some extent, which we've already seen in-game. Do we want to bring back the elemental dragons, but either die or mutate from too much elemental exposure? Or is the secret of the Abyss the real truth that's hidden from the world, and the corruption with forbidden knowledge is the real ending? Maybe a world where the previous gods run the world, and humans must obey their laws and receive blessings from the sky. A world without gods, perhaps, run by corrupt elders that sacrifice sun children or aristocratic people. Or is it possible to have a peaceful balance of different power where there's no room for maneuver, making all three powers restrain each other, creating a trinity of all the three realms? But that decision is going to depend on us. Rather, you, the traveler. So maybe a balance between the three realms is what the human realm wants after all. I mean, many dragons and humans can work together and have worked together in the past. So it's possible that the human realm and the light realm can live in harmony and maybe even beat the void realm. But humans and the abyss have also been working together, evident in Conria and the abyss order, as well as our sibling. And although destructive and twisted, maybe they really are right and our sibling knows the actual truth of the world. But I'll save that for a different video, one that's about two realms working together to beat another. So for now, I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like comment if you enjoyed, subscribe and hit the bell for more of my ramblings, and stay mad theorists. Bye!